Hello again, this is John Burroughs. I'm going to continue on with my autobiography, Seven Years to Life, and this is chapter 45, and it's called You Had to Be There. I enjoyed the time I worked at gas stations, especially working the night shift or being the manager. I met and worked with some of the most interesting people that I have known. I learned that running a successful small business was more than just opening the doors. There was inventory control, balancing the books without computers and spreadsheets, and the accounting software that is available to businesses today. Just about everyone that was licensed to drive did so. Therefore, I cannot think of a more diverse customer base. If you were dedicated to learning about people and treating them with respect, it opened doors, some good, some not so good. But nonetheless, you had more opportunities to choose from. <clears throat> Excuse me. The fact of the matter is that when people feel that you are trustworthy, friendly, and honestly want to help them, then those people will go out of their way to return the favor. It is a humbling yet proud moment when a customer tells you uh, they, that they consider you more a friend than someone who provides a service to them. I had drinks with many of them, exchanged personal tragedies and triumphs, and eventually married one of them. That story comes later. The gas shortage in the 70s provided an unexpected opportunity that was not so honorable, but for a young single male, it was a godsend. In many cases, uh, stations did not exactly run out of gas, but technically they were not supposed to pump over a certain amount of gallons each day. In theory, this made the gas last longer, and additionally, it was sometimes required that a customer could only receive eight gallons. This resulted in long, unbearable lines that took close to an hour before you arrived at the pump. In our situation, what we do is, would do is take our service truck with a sign attached to it that read, this is the last vehicle for gas. This helped because when people saw the sign, they knew not to get in line. I was working at 42nd Avenue Shell when the shortage was taking place, and I was the service manager. The whole debacle created some real tough business decisions, and unfortunately, in the process, we lost some valuable customers. On the other side of the coin, the shortage uh, catapulted me into a situation of mutual manipulation. There were nearby businesses that employed some of the foxiest young ladies in town. Quite simply, gasoline at this time was more valuable than gold. Sure, if you had some good friends or co-workers, you could carpool, but back then carpooling seemed to be an outrageous hassle. If you were a single, beautiful, open-minded young lady, lucky enough to know someone like me, gas was ready, readily available to you at any time you needed it. Though it was not a requirement, it became awfully hard to say no when I asked you out for a date. Those were some good times. Eventually, the 60 hours work week proved to be a drain on my energy, and I was now spending less time with Georgia, who was now my wife, than I had been spending with her before we were married. In speaking with some of my history friends, uh, hi hippie friends, I found out that the post office uh, was usually hiring, and they suggested that it would be a good idea for me to apply. It was a union job with benefits, 40 hours a week, and I would be making more money than I was bringing in at 60 hours a week. In addition, there was no dress code other than the, un other than the uniform and no restrictions as to how long your hair could be, and the beard was perfectly acceptable, which was usually not the case in, in the private sector. If you had an inside position where it was not necessary to face the public, then you can pretty much dress how you wanted with some minor restrictions. I submitted my application and so much time passed that I was about to give up hope when the call came in asking me to come down to the airmail facility at the San Francisco International Airport. I was hired but was considered a temporary employee until I completed a six months probation period. If I made it past the six months, I would be given a job title that meant I would be assigned to the same duties every day. Until that time, I did a little bit of everything from casing mail to loading and unloading trucks. K 
casing male consisted of sitting in the center of a three-sided cubicle. One side was directly in front of me, one side was to my left, and the other was to my right. Each side was divided into 16 equally proportioned boxes with pieces of rope that ran from the top to the bottom of each column of each side. There were, there were cubicles designed for casing letters and other cubicles specifically designed for casing flats, such as magazines, etc. Each box in each side of a cubicle had a zip code printed on the top of it. Another employee would bring trays of mail that had been previously sorted for the 48 zip codes in your cubicle. The job was to take the trays of mail and put the individual pieces in the box that had the matching zip codes. Memorization of each zip code was crucial to doing the job efficiently in the event a piece of mail was missing the zip code. The idea of the ropes that ran from top to the bottom was to facilitate a faster way of clearing a full box. Another employee would watch for boxes nearing capacity, grab a tray, push the rope to the side, and empty the full box of mail that all contained the same zip code. They would then take these trays to another part of the facility where they were loaded onto vans that would deliver the case mail to the appropriate post office for that particular zip code or codes. The mail would then be broken down further by the carriers whose job it was to deliver the mail to the address on their route. There was a letter sorting machine where the machine operator would have a letter flash before his or her eyes every 10 seconds or so. This operator would take a look at the zip code and the machine would whisk it along to the vans. It was a considerably faster way of sorting, but that was all the operator could handle for six and a half hours each day. It became exasperating because if you could not handle each piece in 10 seconds, another piece was on its way. It was hard keeping people on that job, regardless of the shorter shift and higher pay. I know that last paragraph may be boring to some. In fact, I got bored just writing about it. It did not take me long for me to be able to confidently, confidently describe the air, air mail facility, <coughs> excuse me, have all, have having all the necessary components of a great sitcom. So settle back and prepare yourself to be entertained as I convey, convey to you some of my experiences. You, you will see you will also see why I included the previous paragraph. After working at the facility for a month or so, I began to develop, to develop a number of friendships. One of the friendships was with Leslie Y. She was definitely a free spirit and like me, she had started at the same time. Regardless of the fact that working for the post office was a highly coveted job because of the aforementioned reasons, most employees in our age group did not have hard work on the job as their highest priority. They viewed the job as more of an opportunity to have fun and socialize, especially when they realized, like I did, that very few employees, managers or otherwise, took the job seriously. If you add to the fact that once you got by your six month probation, it was virtually impossible to get fired. Leslie and I became very close friends and remained close for many years. The cornerstone of our friendship was that she loved to laugh and I loved to make people laugh. She told, many she told many times over the years that I was the funniest and wittiest person that she had ever known in her life. Leslie was a prankster and was constantly victimizing me at work. Her favorite trick that she loved to pull on me and some other friends was to sneak along the back of the casing cubicles while other people were casing mail. When you were just about done casing a couple of trays of mail and all the zip code boxes in your cubicle were practically full, she would suddenly appear on the other side and would give this mis mischievous smile just before using the ropes that ran from top to bottom of the rows as rubber bands that would catapult the mail that you just got through casing all over the floor in a jumbled heap. It was impossible not to laugh at the sturdy trick, uh, but it was also utterly frustrating because when she did that, 
It was two hours worth of work that had just been wasted. Management did take notice of her shenanigans, and I know it was documented on her three months evaluation. It did not seem to face her because she was always doing something other than working, like constantly socializing or flirting. The longer I knew her, the more I liked her, yet there were signs that she enjoyed causing trouble, especially among couples, just to see what would happen. There will be more about that later in the book. The airmail facility functioned 24 hours a day, and I felt very fortunate to have been assigned to day shifts. It was also my first experience with unions, and they had a definite purpose back then, and protection from workplace injustices was crucial because the injustices were actually quite commonplace. I also learned about some of the asinine clauses in the union contracts with the companies that employed the people they represented. I was witness to and part of an instance that vividly brought to light the foolishness of one of the clauses. It was so stupid that it was just plain sad, and in this instance, it brought pro productivity to a standstill. Not all airmail was flown by post office planes. In fact, much of it was contracted out to cargo plane outfits, such as the Flying Tigers. The postal employees had union represent representation, and so did the Flying Tigers. The Flying Tigers also operated out of the San Francisco airport. When it was necessary to use the Flying Tigers, the post office driver would drop off one, of one or more of their truck trailers loaded with mail at the Flying Tigers loading dock. The sliding back door of the trailer would open, revealing all the mail and two postal employees inside. Two employees of the Flying Tigers would then wheel a portable conveyor belt and place it in a position where one half of the belt extended into the postal van and the other half was positioned on the Flying Tigers loading dock. The postal employees would place sacks of mail on the belt and fly, Flying Tigers employees would remove the bags on the other end. They would place them in canvas bins that were hauled in train-like fashion via a golf cart out to the plane to be loaded on. Sometimes conditions that were forced on employees by union contracts were not only illogical, they were absurd and wasted valuable time and resources, not to mention money. Here is a prime example. The postal contract had a clause that post office employees could not set foot on Flying Tigers property when performing their jobs. The same was true for Flying Tigers employees. They could not set foot on post office property. There was also a clause agreed upon by both tar parties that if a Flying Tigers plane landed that all other work in this case, the post office would cease while the recently landed plane's cargo was unloaded. In most cases, it was a two or three hour process to unload the plane. This meant that the postal employee had to wait in the van doing nothing, absolutely nothing, for the amount of time it took for the plane to be unloaded. This situation happened more than you would think, and in rare instances, it happened twice within the same shift. It got to the point that when I was sent over there, I would bring a book or a deck of cards just in case. You can figure out for yourselves that if either party had not been prohibited by such ridiculous contractual obligations, the obvious sensible solution to the problem. I worked at the air mail facility at the height of the Vietnam War. Aside from the typical letters from the soldiers to their loved ones, Voice cassettes became an extremely popular and preferred way of many of the soldiers to communicate with their loved ones and close friends. Because of this, the airmail facility created a special belt to handle the amazing amount of voice cassettes that started to arrive from Vietnam. It was appropriately named the Vietnam Belt. As the cassettes came down the belt, the employees, usually four or five people, would identify the zip code and throw the cassette in the bin that was marked with the right zip code. The first time I was assigned to the Vietnam belt, I immediately noticed that the other employees working the belt would take a case 
and prior to depositing it into the designated bin, bin, they would hold the cassette to their ear and shake it. I also noticed that in some instances, a person would shake a cassette, and rather than deposit it into a bin, they would secret secretively, almost like a professional magician, slip the cassette into their pocket. The technique was amazing, and if you were not watching for it, it was almost impossible to see it. A couple of cassettes later, the person who pocketed the cassette would leave saying he or she had to use the bathroom. Eventually, I worked up the nerve to ask one of the people that I had seen do the aforementioned r ritual. <clears throat> Speaking softly, he answered my question without any reluctance. The soldiers would send cases filled with grams of hash or weed. When something other than a cassette was in the case, the sound it made when shaken was distinctly different from that of a cassette. I do not, re I do not recall cameras in the facility, though I have no doubt they were there. It is because of that possibility it was important you mastered the various techniques used to slip a cassette case into your pocket unnoticed. Like most of the big casinos, the airmail facility had security mirrors placed in strategic places throughout the facility where a manager could observe what was happening below. The reason, uh, the reason for going to the bathroom was that cameras and mirrors were illegal in restrooms for the obvious reasons. I think the cameras and mirrors were more of a psychological deterrent because I worked the Vietnam Belt numerous times, I heard all the stories of the hash scores, but never once did I hear of anyone getting busted. I started to shake cassettes, and it was always the same. I always heard the identifiable sound of a cassette. I was about ready to abandon the effort when one day I shook a cassette, and the sound was the one I had been looking for. I must admit that I deftly performed a maneuver that allowed me to successfully slide the cassette into my pocket. The people working the belt with me did not even notice. My excitement was overwhelming me to the point that I wanted to sprint to the bathroom. But I also knew that I had to appear nonchalant so I would not arouse suspicion. I waited a little while and then I then said I had to go to the bathroom. The guy who told me about this was there, and he just glanced my way knowingly. The closer I got to the restroom, the faster my heart beat, and I could actually smell the fear and anticipation emanating from me. I finally entered the bathroom, kicked open the stall door, then closed it, locked it, sat down on the toilet with my pants down around my ankles to give the impression that I was using the stall for what it was designed for. I frantically ripped off the wrapper of the cassette holder, then looked at it for a little while, savoring the moment. I opened the cassette holder, and much to my dismay, I was staring at a small package of volcanic dust that had come from a volcano uh, somewhere that after years of being dormant had become active again. I started laughing and crying simultaneously. I had just put myself through some makeshift James Bond exercise, knowing I would find that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, but I might as well found, have found a packet of shit from some exotic Vietnamese jungle bird. I guess that is what they call a lie, a, a live and you, uh, and you learn moment because I never attempted to do it again. Not long after the cassette debacle, I was assigned to the airmail air, air facility dock located at the rear of the building. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is where the drivers would back up the 80-foot trailer vans that were, that were backed up right against the dock. My job was to assist in the unloading of incoming mail and the loading of outgoing mail. This was the most physically demanding job in the place. The mail was packed into large red vinyl sacks and, when full, usually weighed in the vicinity of 85 pounds. I was assisting this older black guy who said to call him Bootsy, and by the time we finished unloading the van, I was exhausted. 
yet Bootsy had barely broken a sweat, and the whole time we were unloading the van, he was telling me fishing stories that I could barely understand due to my exhaustion and his accent that was as thick as the Alabama humidity. I was able to discern that he was from Alabama. He had to be 30 years older than me and 20 pounds lighter than me, yet he had easily outworked me and constantly smiled, which, by the way, pissed me off. Bootsy then said to me, it's time to load this sucker up uh, with the outgoing mail. I said to myself, you have to be fucking shitting me. He saw my head drop in defeat and said, hold on a minute, don't look so down. Loading makes unloading look like a picnic. You just follow my directions and you will see what I mean. All I could see was 85 feet of empty sp space that had to be loaded up with heavy mail sacks. We started loading the van, but this time Bootsy gave me explicit constructions on how and where to place every mail sack. After a short time, with about 20 feet of the van loaded, Bootsy nudged me and told me it was break time. I knew it was not break time. He told me to turn around and look at the work we had completed so far. I turned around and by following Bootsy's directions, we had built a red igloo out of mail sacks with an entrance big enough to crawl through. He told me to crawl inside, which I did without any hesitation, because I did not fear the man. He followed right behind me and we sat down facing each other. I was bewildered and finally asked, now what? His reply was unexpected yet hilarious. He grinned from ear to ear and proclaimed, did I say it was break time? I meant to say that it, that it was ripple time. Sure enough, out of his pocket came a bottle of Ripple that we shared for the next 20 minutes or so, while at the same time we shared jokes and personal anecdotes. When the Ripple was gone, we left the bottle there and crawled out of the igloo and disguised the entrance with a couple of more sacks of mail. We walked the remaining 60 feet back to the loading dock. I started to pick up another sack of mail to finish loading when Boosie stopped me. He put his finger over his closed lips that everyone knows is the universal be quiet sign. He pulled the door of the trailer closed, locked it and gave two hard slaps on the side of the trailer. That was the signal that the driver was loaded up and ready to go. I was loaded. Bootsy was loaded. We looked at each other and I remembered thinking as the truck pulled away, how surprised the guys at the other end were going to be when they found a few mail sacks, 60 feet of empty space, and a bottle of R Ripple. Here's to you, Bootsy. Perhaps the funniest remembrance I have from my days at the airmail facility is a situation that I actually used in my short-lived stand-up comedy career. I was leaving the building uh, for some lunchtime activities of which I enjoy taking part in. As I was exiting the building approximately five minutes after the horn blared that signaled it was lunchtime for that particular shift, I stopped and looked out at the large employee parking lot uh, that probably had 120 cars packed there. As I stared at all the cars, I remember thinking to myself that the scene would have made a wonderful painting and an accurate depiction of the culture that was pervasive at the time in this country's history. Most of the employees brought their lunches to work for a number of reasons. But the reason that carried the most weight was that if you decided to go out and eat somewhere, you would miss the lunchtime activities. Picture looking at 120 cars in the parking lot and about 30% of the cars are empty. Uh, two or more people were usually seated in the various cars. You could see that roughly half of the cars were filled with smoke and their windows were rolled up. In the other half of the cars, you could not help but notice the brown bags that were going up and down. There were exceptions, but in most cases, the cars that contained the brown bags rising and falling usually had black folk in them. The smoke-filled cars usually had long-haired hippies in them. Most of the time, I was in a smoke-filled car, but occasionally I would visit a brown bagger 
and partake of some of the sacramental wine. The opposite would sometimes occur where a brown bagger, bagger would visit the hairy ones in order to receive the sacramental communion. However, it was not in the form of a host. I will never forget the day where I was returning from lunch after being in one of the smoke-filled cars, uh, completely stoned to the point where I was giggling as I entered the facility. One of my many supervisors approached me, and as I saw him coming, I was able to transform my, transform my giggling into a smirk. What he then said to me turned my smirk into a paranoid frown. He had told me to go over to the custom belt and assist in loading packages and different sorts of mail on the belt. The customs belt was different because it helped facilitate the distribu distribution of international mail, and part of that distribution process was a sheriff that had a leashed pot-stiffing dog for obvious reasons. I begged my boss to put me anywhere but there, and unfortunately, he would not acquiesce to my pleas. It was with a hanging head and thumping heart that I slowly made my way to the customs belt. As soon as I was relatively close to the belt, the dog ceased sniffing the packages, and while practically jerking the sheriff off his feet, came running to me, vigorously sniffing me up and down as if I was its long-lost owner. I have to say that I was pretty damn sure that I was going to be terminated. However, much to my surprise, the sheriff just looked at me and frustratingly said, Tell your boss to send me a wino, not a pothead. I can't count the times I've told them that if it looks like a hippie, it probably smells like a hippie. It was an amazing time in history where tolerance came from where you least expected it. I did not get fired that day. It was a few months later, and how it happened has long passed, but I still feel stupid about why it occurred. Wesley and I had become extremely close friends over the time we worked there. Our six months of valuations came along, and though mine was identical to hers, she got fired and I didn't. She went to the union and explained that it seemed not only unfair but suspicious that two people with identical evaluations resulted in only one of them getting terminated. The union filed a grievance on Leslie's behalf, and their investigation uncovered that management felt that women were not properly equipped to work the loading dock in an efficient manner. They also uncovered that they were always short of people to work the loading dock, and because of that, male employees, especially temporary ones waiting for their permanent assignment, were infinitely more valuable. This was obviously sexist, and to rectify the situation fairly, and in light of the fact that our, our our evaluations were identical. They fired me also. Though I was irate about it at the time and angry at Leslie for even bringing it to the union's attention, I now thankfully realize it was just another incident that altered my path to where I am now. I now thankfully realize it was just an, another incident that altered my path to where I am now. S sorry about repeating that supported by a loving family and some friends and working hard to better myself each and every day.